Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. And uh, what I'm going to try to do over uh, the time I have is introduce you to the work and ideas of the World Youth Alliance and then outline the projects that have grown out of that that we're building today. So 20 years ago, the World Youth Alliance was founded at the United Nations during a conference on population and development. At this conference, uh, 32 young people were invited and spoke to all of the delegates present. They said, we represent all three billion of the world's youth, and these are our demands as young people. They demanded abortion as a human right, sexual rights for children, and a deletion of parents' rights. At a conference on population and development focused on the needs of the world's poorest of the poor, nothing for the poor was mentioned, nothing about clean water, housing, education. So I went back into the conference the next morning. I had drafted day glow pink flyers that said, these youth do not represent all of the world's youth. I broke the rules gave these to everyone, and this caused pandemonium. <laughs> For two hours, the negotiations were stalled, and in that time, the world divided. The Western states went and clustered around the US delegation, the Clinton delegation at the time, but many of the developing nations came up to me and said, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for saying what you have said. And they said, we need you to have a presence at the United Nations full time. And they also said, come to our countries and work with our young people. This was the beginning of the World Youth Alliance. The next year, at 3 o'clock in the morning, which is when all of the serious negotiations happen at the UN, this top phrase was proposed by the Clinton US delegation. It was a short oral amendment that said human rights grant human dignity. Human rights grant human dignity. This was a very important moment for me because it was the moment where I could understand what the core idea was uniting all of these disparate claims that were showing up in these documents. The idea that human rights grant human dignity is the complete reversal of the human rights project. It's the complete reversal of the UN idea of human rights enshrined in the Declaration of Human Rights, which recognizes that human rights respect the dignity of the human person. The dignity of the human person is first, and human rights are legal instruments that come out of how the world and how nation states respect that human dignity. This showed us that fundamentally, deeper than the questions and debates about abortion, deeper than the questions and debates about population control, deeper than the questions and debates about all of the sexual issues that were being debated, was a question about the human person. At the heart of the debates at the United Nations and at the heart of the debates about human rights today is fundamentally this question of the human person. Who are we? And therefore, how must we act towards ourselves and towards each other. I just want to show you one small example. We have little time. But this is an example of how this language of human rights is often misused in order to drive different agendas. And what's important to see here is that this is a non-governmental organization, one that's very powerful at the UN, one that impacts many UN documents and decisions. And what they're saying here is that many human rights instruments protect the right to life. This is true. What they're also saying, as you continue to read through this, is a conclusion that says forcing a woman to undergo abortion threatens her right to life. What are they saying? They're saying that the promotion of abortion is part of the right to life. This is what we began to understand in those days. We understood, number one, the debate is a debate about the human person. Is the human person an intrinsically inviolable being with human dignity for which we must protect and respect that human dignity through our actions and through our rights if we want to be free and just societies? Or is the human person an object which can be used and discard by us or by states towards our ends? 
we saw two things again. We saw we have to understand the language because you can see if you're reading this that it's quite complex and quite convoluted. And we have to understand what it is that we're facing if we want to fight to defend the human person well. What we also understood was that ideas are, let's say, embodied. Ideas have consequences, and especially when we're talking about ideas relating to the human person, these are ideas that will fundamentally and realistically be related to this reality of the human person itself. What we saw at the UN, we can see now in the United States and everywhere that policy is made, which is that policy is not just a debating society. Policy is a way to take ideas, fundamentally ideas about the human person and the societies in which we want to live, and put them into action. And this means that policy drives funding, can be local or international or national, and funding is for program implementation. And this is very important because what we saw at the United Nations and what we see in the United States as well is that we can win on policy and we will lose those policy fights if we cannot implement them. And we saw at the UN that the most important group that understands this is International Planned Parenthood Federation. We have won victories over the last 20 years, the most important at Cairo, John Paul II's victory. But we are in danger of losing that because we are not implementing those ideas on the ground. And the primary implementer internationally for those ideas is International Planned Parenthood Federation. And we have similar debates happening in this country, particularly when we look at the HHS fight and we look at some of the debates that continue to unfold today. So we saw that we could have the right ideas we could have ideas rooted in reality. We could understand and do the work of understanding these ideas. This is the great work at the heart of so many of these policy and think tank organizations that we do and that many other groups do. But what we were not able to do was put those ideas into practice, particularly at the touch points where these ideas are driving their ongoing engagement with shaping and changing policy and culture around the world. And what we saw over and over is that in shaping policy and culture for the end of abortion and population control, the two implementation programs that do this in every country, and if we look at the history of the United States, we see it happened here as well, the two key programmatic implementation areas are gender and sexual education, so this idea of the human person. Who am I? Think of it as marketing for young people to understand who they are. And then an idea of women's reproductive health that is reduced to contraception and abortion. With these as the only implementation options, it will not be possible for us to drive a new policy wheel forward. And so the question we had to face at a certain moment in time was can we develop new gender or sexual education ideas that embody our vision of the human person? And can we develop new programs for women's health that embody respect for the dignity of a woman at every stage in her life. And so I briefly want to now show you how we answered these questions. We think the answer is yes, we can. We did. We have developed, let's say, a prototype A in each of these areas, and I just want to walk you through that very quickly. The human dignity curriculum is our answer to this idea of gender. I think we need to understand gender as a secular anthropology. Both of these ideas are asking the question, who am I? And when we answer that question, who am I? It impacts the second question, how will I live? What am I made for? What will I do? The human dignity curriculum is now available for grades K through eight, and a high school component will be built up. For our women's health answer, we developed FEM, which stands for Fertility Education and Medical Management. And I wanna just show you the very brief outlines of each of these projects. The Human Dignity Curriculum is the first curriculum that really teaches this anthropological idea of the human person to children. Children respond to big ideas, they love big ideas, and this is what we provide to them. Who am I, and what am I made for, and how do I learn the skills, the habits for human excellence to accomplish that? These are the core themes of the Human Dignity Curriculum. We start in kindergarten, and they start to become little philosophers who can answer these questions very concretely about who they are and who they want to become. 
That ties in then to our sexual education curriculum, which is an application of FEM, which comes in at the later ages, and ties in. So we always remember that even though hormones are directing the growth of our bodies, they're directing hormones and changes, we can always decide how we want to think and choose to respond to those changes. So we want to tie all of this together as these ideas are shaping and moving in our lives. And children love this. And so we've seen similar results from around the world as we've piloted this program from Mexico to the Philippines to the Bronx to other schools in the United States. Children say, finally, I have a curriculum that teaches me about myself. And this is so important because an understanding of personal identity is the single strongest indicator of future choices and behaviors. Now to FEM. With FEM, we're looking at a program that integrates a number of things. We want to teach women who they are and their bodies, how they work. We want to link women to coaches who can assist them with questions that arise. We want to link them to medical providers who can diagnose and treat the underlying symptoms they're experiencing. And our app gives us a way to bring this information to women so that we can respond to them in an individual and personalized way and help to provide this support. A little bit of biology. So very quickly, what we're looking at with FEM is this idea that reproductive endocrinology, that is hormones, are the unifying factor in a woman's body. And this unifying factor, it affects our physical and also our emotional health. And what you can see here at the top is the effect of the four major reproductive hormones in our ovary and what that hormone graph looks like as those unfold. So our hormones direct how our bodies work, but we have to remember that the first trigger for these hormones comes from our brain. So FSH comes from the brain. It triggers the action of estrogen, which starts to build and get produced in the ovary. The important thing that you can see here is that we want to see estrogen rising on a slope. It's that slope action, not the amount that's key. And what we're doing if we get that slope rise is it drives another hormone from the brain, which causes ovulation. And following ovulation, we get the production of progesterone. So progesterone is only produced if ovulation takes place because it's the empty follicle that produces progesterone. Why does this matter? It matters because ovulation is a sign of health because ovulation tells us that every hormone is touching every body, every part of our body and system from our brain to our organs to the development of our bones. And here you can see how estrogen and progesterone, the right amounts at the right time are critical to the development of all of these areas of our body. So ovulation is a sign of health and fertility is a sign of health. But we want to make sure that especially young girls in the moment of that brain plasticity are receiving the right signals so that their brain and their bones and their body develop as they should. We also know that sometimes these hormone signals go wrong and women have many, many symptoms. And the most common way of managing those symptoms is to put women on the pill. One third of the women in the world, in the United States we have the data, are on the pill to manage these symptoms. But we know that in young women under 24, that's closer to two thirds or even as high as 84%. Here's a picture of our app, which allows us to give this individual feedback to every woman. It helps us to say, here's what you're observing, this is what hormone is dominant for you, and help them to identify abnormalities when they arise. And now briefly, when we see these abnormalities, it's because physiologically we're seeing cycles that are too long or too short, too much bleeding, too much pain, any other symptoms, and that moves us to a hormonal profile workup that moves through all of this evaluation and analysis to identify the underlying diagnosis so that we can treat that fundamental cause. So the World Youth Alliance has responded in the policy sphere. We understood that the big question facing us is the question of the human person. We saw that to move these policy ideas forward, we need to have programs that can embody the human person in the areas that are most <coughs> under attack. And we have developed the Human Dignity Curriculum, Teen Fem, and Fem to provide that coordinated response for implementation in the United States and around the world. 
And I'm happy to say this is now starting to grow. We have partnerships in the US and in many schools. We are starting to have governments approving the human dignity curriculum. And we now have FEM providers in the United States and globally that are offering this kind of care as we expand these resources. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm grateful for your time today.